So thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Ben, and thank you very much for the invitation to come here and talk to you guys about uh, some of the work that I'm doing at the moment. I'm actually in the process of writing a book about the financial crisis, um, and this uh, the, the, a, a version of this will eventually be the last chapter um, in that book, um, dealing with uh, uh, the idea of where we go from here in terms of uh, disciplining ourselves and so that we don't go down the path of monetary uh, irresponsibility and fiscal irresponsibility, which I currently think our country is on the, the path of doing. Uh, this is work uh, with a colleague of mine, Leah Palagasvili, uh, who has uh, just joined the, uh, just signed a contract uh, to join the staff at uh, SUNY uh, State University of New York at Purchase. And um, so the title of our book is Against uh, Triage Economics, <coughs> Misadventures in Economic Emergency Rooms. So you shouldn't have any doubt where we're coming from. Basically the metaphor is, is that we ran into a crisis, we got thrown into an economic emergency room, and guys like Hank Polson and Ben Bernanke, rather than you know, curing the patient so they could walk later on, started like cutting off their legs and things like that. And so that it, it threatens the long run survival of our economy. So always think in the back of your head of the trade off between long term economic growth and vitality and short run relief from economic disturbances. And if our political system is always biased towards short run relief at the expense of long run economic vitality, then you're going to have a very poor economic future, right? And that's the problem uh, that we're trying to do. So now let's step back into the into the thicket here of this. Um, let's see if I can get this to work right. There we go. So does anyone know where this picture's from? Go ahead. Where? where? Hobbes' Leviathan. Yeah, it's the front piece of Hobbes' Leviathan. You, I don't know if you can see it, but there's all kinds of people that are involved in. Leviathan there, and uh, the idea was is that, you know, life is nasty, brutish, and short unless we contract with a sovereign who will organize our affairs over us. But of course, the problem with this just raises the age-old political theory problem, which is who guards the guardians? This goes all the way back, of course, to Plato, but comes all the way through it and, and into our own founding fathers. In particular, this is Madison's problem, right? Uh, if men were to be, if, if, if uh, men were angels, there'd be no need for government. If government were to be run by angels, there'd be no need for constraints. But precisely because we're going to ask men to rule over other men, we must first empower the government and then constrain it. Large part of what Leah and I are doing in our book is asking the question, how well have we done at solving Madison's dilemma? And in particular, how well has our Constitution been able to actually function? How many here were here in the fall when Judge Napolitano spoke? All right, a lot of you, right? There's a great line in there where he was talking about the Constitution's ability to pinch. And one of the things that happened is during the, the Great Depression and the Progressive Era legislation, the idea was is to stop Constitutions from pinching. Right? Constitution should bend whenever there's a crisis. This, of course, most often happens during wartime. During war, this is Higgs's thesis. All right, I'm stealing a little bit of his thunder. When you have crises, what you do is you end up by relaxing all the constraints on government. Government grows, explodes, then the crisis is over. You try to get government back to its normal path, but it never retreats all the way back. So what happens is you continually get this ratchet effect, which leads to an open expansion of government beyond what we would ever want if we were able to you know, express our preferences about the nature of government. Right? That's Higgs' thesis. I'm not really pursuing that thesis in, in this particular project. I'm asking instead, can we restrain or tame Leviathan and how we're gonna go about trying to do that and what have been the efforts at doing that uh, throughout the 20th century. So this is a really uh, interesting book that, I, that I've read. I don't know how many here of you have seen this, 
It's by a man named Michael Grieva. It's called The Upside Down Constitution. It was published by Harvard. And uh, what Grieva argues in there um, is that we used to have this system of checks and balances, right? So if you actually read Madison, say Federalist 51, right? In Federalist 51, he says what we need to do is we need to basically align the incentives such that ambition checks ambition. So they, they, block, they checkmate each other, right? And, um, and the Constitution was set up to do that. And one of the ways that we did that was through our Federalist system. All right, so New Jersey is, you know, competing for a tax base with Pennsylvania, right, and, and New York. And if New Jersey policies are bad, you simply vote with your feet to move to these different areas. And internally to a state, like in New Jersey, if you're in Union County or in Essex County, all right, what you would do is depending on what the supply and demand of public goods are, say, you know, schooling, roads, all kinds of other areas, if they give you a good package for the tax dollars, you stay there. If not, you would up and leave and move to a better district. Right, how many in this room have had kids? Come on, you know why, right? Right, unless you're gonna private school your kids, you worry about what school district your kids are gonna go to school in. So if the city isn't providing good schools for your kid, you up and leave and go to another place. That's the idea of competition serving. And that was the idea behind Madison's logic of having ambition check ambition. And it carried all the way through the structure of government, the relationship between the states, but also the way in which the federal government itself was organized by checks and balances, right? The executive is checked by the legislative, which is checked by the judicial. All right. Well, what Grieva argues in here is that in the 20th century, we flipped the Constitution on its head because rather than having competition between the states, what we've done is the states have engaged in uh, cartel federalism as opposed to competitive federalism. Mainly, the states have had the ability to get together and say, for example, a, a classic log rolling example. Some of you are in my demographic, so you might remember William Proxmire. For the young kids here, William Proxmire used to give out an award every year called the Golden Fleece Award for the most egregious example of pork barrel spending by the government. Now, Senator Proxmire was from the state of Wisconsin. What did Senator Proxmire believe was the one pork barrel spending that you should never stop? Now you see it every Sunday. It's on the top of the heads of all the Packer fans. What is it? Cheese. Cheese. Dairy products, right? So dairy should always be protected. So now how's he going to get the votes for that? Well, he has to go to Senator Helms who also didn't like pork barrel spending, but he was from North Carolina, so who do you, what do you think he liked? Tobacco. So, Senator Proxmire, you vote for my tobacco protection, and Senator, you know, uh, uh, Helms says, and, you, and I'll vote for your cheese. And there they go, they have it, all right? That's the way in which vote trading takes place in Congress. All right, and as a result, they're able to cartelize. Now, what do we know from economic theory when you have a cartel, okay? They always break down by chiseling, right? They always have an idea of how they could undercut the people they agree with. And they could get, you know, they introduce competition again. Except when what happens? You have a central monitor that enforces it. So when it comes to government, who's that central monitor that enforces it? Washington, D.C. And what Washington, D.C. did was engage in what they called intergovernmental transfers. So you can spend all you want in New Jersey, we'll cover your bill for you. And you go ahead and spend all you want in Wisconsin, we'll cover your bill for you. And this started to happen in the 20th century in a way that never existed before. And the champions of this were the progressives. All right, because what happens when you control the fiscal purse Right? You can affect real actions in government. And so the progressives needed to eliminate the, the checks and balances. That was their idea. Wilson, in congressional government, okay, makes a strong argument for why the modern error should no longer follow the old Jeffersonian logic. 
We're no longer, you know, yeomen out on the frontier, right? We're now where you, you can't spin into the wind without it affecting your neighbor. So we're all in this together. So we're in a new era of interconnectedness. So we can't have ambition checking with ambition. We have to have instead the creative acts by men of goodwill to work in concert with one another to achieve the things that need to be done, especially in the face of emergencies, like a war or depression. And so rather than those checks and balances, which put a limit on government to be able to do things, we're now going to leave them unchecked. Well, here's the problem. You leave government unchecked, you get the first picture I put up, which is unconstrained Leviathan. Now, can, how do you constrain the Leviathan, okay? So, uh, building on the progressives' initiatives, what happens is federalism gets flipped upside on its head. It's no longer competitive federalism, but now cartel federalism. And the main idea here is intergovernmental schemes. Cartel arrangements, and they're able to push through a lot of things, which otherwise they wouldn't push through. Okay, so the Grieva book and Richard Epstein's book, The Classical Liberal Constitution, are very excellent books for you if you want to kind of understand you know, sort of where the politics of all of this um, sort of is going. So the argument that, that Leah and I develop sort of goes as follows. So let me make a meta argument first, okay? Here's a meta argument, which is all theories of public administration have to have a theory of public finance. How are they gonna pay for the activities that they're engaged in? Right? Everyone with me, that's not controversial. Now, all theories of public finance have an implicit theory of the state. Because it tells you what the state should be doing and what the state shouldn't be doing. For example, in the United States, we don't expect the states to produce shoes for us. But in the Soviet Union, they did. But we don't because we think the private market can produce shoes. So let the private market do that. But we believe that the state is necessary to produce police services, right? Everyone, that's not kind of right. And so we say, oh, police, that's a public good, therefore the government must provide it, all right? Now, there's people that could challenge that and we'll come back to that at the end. But for right now, just stick with that kind of argument. But, you know, but that means that you have an implicit political philosophy about what the role of government is, what the appropriate role of government is, and what the inappropriate role of government is. All right, and you're trying, so that tells you what you should be paying for and what you shouldn't be paying for. And then it gets even more complicated because you could make an argument that for some goods, the government should fund it, but not provide it. Right? The government could provide resources for its existence, but the private market should be the one providing the good. All right, Those are all theories of the state, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. So you have to have that in the back of your head when you're thinking about what happened. Adam Smith has a great line in the notebooks that led to the wealth of nations. He said, you can go from the lowest forms of barbarism to the highest forms of opulence, you just need three things. Peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. Now, there's the question. You kind of know what peace means. Not killing each other, right? You know, don't, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. That's peace. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Easy taxes, right? That means get your hand out of my pocket. Right? You don't have to confiscate all my wealth. Leave me alone. Okay? But here's the one you don't have an answer for. Tolerable administration of justice. What is it? In Adam Smith's time, it meant something different than it means in our time. Or in our time, meaning this. One of my favorite essays is an essay by Davy Crockett that's published a lot in the Foundation for Economic Education. And it's called Not Yours to Give. And I'll try to be quick with this because I don't want to get derailed, but what Davy Crockett did was he, when he was a congressman, there was a fire in Georgetown and the family um, suffered greatly because of this fire. 
And so Congress got together and appropriated funds to help the family in Georgetown. And so when Davy Crockett came back to run for re-election, he ran into one of his constituents, and his constituent said, I'm not giving you your vote. And he said, why? He goes, if, if you want to help the family in Georgetown, pay with your own money. It's my money shouldn't go to help that family in Georgetown. It's not yours to give. If I want to help the family in Georgetown, I will. All right, now that actually was a very, very quintessential American public philosophy at one time. Could you imagine today if we tried to have that public philosophy with respect to like say Katrina, right? And we just said, no Orleans, it's really terrible. Red Cross, get to work. Oh, shouldn't you have FEMA and everything? No, it's not yours to give. Why should we give money to them? You know, people are living at the bottom of a soup bowl, right? You know, does everyone, have you ever been to New Orleans lately? Here's the thing. Do you know that nothing in the, in the French Quarter got destroyed during the hurricane? Why? Because even Indians know you don't build on the bottom of a soup bowl. They built where the land was higher, right? Took other people to build down here and got paid to do so. And then you flood it up and then they got paid to rebuild in there. All right, so that's a whole other story, but that affects like the way that we think about these issues. But if we now believe that it's intolerable not for our pol politicians to respond to that kind of outrage, then we're going to have to have a theory of the state which says the appropriate role of government is to bail out those kind of situations. That wasn't always the case, right? And so the question that we have to constantly keep coming back to is what are the appropriate roles of government Right? What, what can government do well? What can it do well? Let's make sure that government is restrained to do those things and only those things that it can do well and keep out of its hands those things it can't do well. Right? Now that's an empirical question. No, nothing here is like I'm not stacking the deck. I'm just simply asking restrict government to those activities that it does well and only those activities that it does well and you know, otherwise rely on the civil society and the market to handle those goods and services. All right, so keep that in the background. Now here's the argument, because that was kind of the American ideology. <laughs> All right? And with that came an old time fiscal religion. Now the old time fiscal religion really comes from Adam Smith again. So I said tolerable administration. If you go to the fifth book of the Wealth of Nations, that's Adam Smith sort of giving his advice to a statesman. So the first four books of the Wealth of Nations are really devoted to trying to help improve our social understanding and maybe provide a little social criticism, like what's wrong with the mercantilist system that existed at his time and whatnot. But it wasn't advice to a statesman, but the fifth book is. The fifth book is, okay, so now let's imagine that we're in a different world and we're going to have these. And one of the things that's striking for a modern reader is how much of that analysis is bound by rules. Smith doesn't give exact details of what you should do. He tells you rules that you should live by. These are the rules that government, sound government, should live by. Well, with regard to fiscal policy, he has a great imagery that, I, that is very important for me to communicate to you to get across. All right, so what he says is that the natural proclivity of all governments is to engage in deficit financing, accumulate public debt, and then debase the currency to pay the debt down with cheaper money, cheaper monetary money. Okay? So, and he uses war as the reason why most states engage in deficit financing. The health of the state, the war is the health of the state. That's in Adam Smith. It's later on made famous by a name Randolph Bourne. But it's actually in Adam Smith. War is the health of the state. The problem is, is that in order for us to engage in our military adventurism, we don't have the resources today to do that, so we engage in deficit financing. We accumulate the debt, and then we clip the coins, debase the currency to pay it back. And he refers to this as the juggling tricks that all governments engage in, ancient as well as modern governments. So I want you to keep that imagery in your head. Government as a juggler, one hand has monetary policy, the other hand has fiscal policy, 
and they're juggling away. Three balls, deficit, debt, and debasement. Right, and they're jugglers. Now Adam Smith thought juggling's annoying. It's kind of like a mine. You want to stop it, right? You know, a mine comes to you, and you're like, "Yeah, hey, I don't want to do that." Only French people like that, uh, right? And so, you know, and so they're juggling, and he says, "Okay, I got to somehow stop the juggling." All right, and so I got to find rules that stop the juggler from juggling. And from Adam Smith's time all the way up until the 20th century, Western democratic governments were built on that premise. The old time fiscal religion. You may run a deficit in a time of emergency, but then you pay it down as soon as you're no longer in the emergency. Otherwise, you can engage in this endless cycle of deficits, debt, and debasement, which kills economies and kills civilizations. Because again, one of the parts that Adam Smith is highlighting in that book is, you want to go the way of Rome? Unleash the jugglers. Okay? And as people wrote later on, you want to go the way of hyperinflation in France? Unleash the jugglers. Or I could argue in our own time, if you want to go the way of the Soviet Union, right, which is unleash the jugglers. Because one of the things that happened at the collapse of the Soviet Union was the recognition that they had had what they called the huge fiscal gap. That is, their promises to pay for their military expenditures and their so-called welfare state or socialist state, and their ability to generate the revenues for that, okay? Huge fiscal gap. So what they engaged in was massive currency devaluation, which when you expose the ruble to the global market, move the ruble from parity with the dollar to 180 rubles to a dollar, to by the early 1990s to over 5,000 rubles to a dollar. All right? So they engaged in this, in this, this hyperinflation, all right, which came from their fiscal imbalance. So this can kill economies, okay? So that's why you want to do this. So from Adam Smith to the founders, and basically until the Great Depression, you followed the fiscal religion. You might have to run a deficit, just like you and your home might have to run a deficit. But you pay it down as soon as you're done with the crisis. Watch out for the jugglers. Well, what the progressives did is a progressive era ideology <coughs> first transformed the idea of public administration. Public administration is supposed to be unchecked and ruled by experts. Go to college, learn how to be a public administrator. Okay, then what you're going to do is then transform the discipline of economics so that economics serves not as a tool of social understanding, but as a tool of social control. So trained experts can now control the economy through the apparatus of public administration. Now think of what subtly just happened to the juggler. Rather than the juggler being someone who's viewed with suspicion, then now the goal is go to MIT and Harvard and learn how to be a master juggler. That's what it means. You go to, you go to these schools, finest schools in the world, by the way, 85% of all plum jobs in academics and in policy are owned by people that went to MIT or Harvard or, or are associated with MIT or Harvard. Okay, 85%, okay? So it's not like, you know, they're, they're getting people in a wide democratic, you know, swath of population. It's a very, very concentrated market. And they are the master jugglers. Whether their names be Larry Summers or Janet Yellen or whoever, they claim to be master jugglers. Or Ben Bernanke. I've learned how to be the master juggler. Right? I can juggle this the right way so that I can actually flood the economy with cash and suck up the excess reserves at the same time. So think about someone standing on a ball juggling with a vacuum cleaner on their toe and they're sucking up the extra cash so that and they don't ever lose a ball. They don't drop a ball. Because if you drop a ball, you're in trouble, right? Even by their own assumptions, you drop the ball, you're in real big trouble. Right? That, that leads to all kinds of crisis. Okay, so since the old constraints on the scale and scope of government were no longer binding, nor were they even viewed as justified 
So they're no longer intolerable for government to now do all kinds of things which previously was intolerable, not yours to give. Now it'd be outrage if you didn't give. That's all been transformed. The post-World War II changes in the nature of politics and economics in Western democratic states is not sustainable. Okay? If your deficit is greater percentage of your GDP than at your GDP grows, you'll never be able to pay down your debt. Right? Simple mathematics. All right? And if your debt to GDP ratio gets to be 90%, despite what you might have heard about the debate over this, the evidence is pretty clear. Your, your income growth declines drastically. Now, what do we mean by that, okay? The reason why the United States is as wealthy as it is is not because we grew at 7% per year. It's because we grow at 2 to 3% a year every year for 100 years. That's the miracle of compound interest applied to an economy. So if you're not able to grow at that rate because you're killing yourself with your debt payments, Okay? You're not going to be able to experience the kind of wealth. You're actually going to eat in to the wealth of your grandchildren and your, cho and your children's children and your grandchildren's children. Okay? And so this creates an institutional problem. Now, very important point in economics. You cannot answer empirical questions philosophically. You have to answer them empirically. Okay? That's one. It's a very important lesson. A lot of people love to answer empirical problems philosophically. And so then they theorize about their ideal solutions to things. Okay? What you need to do, without any words, like if pink fairies in tutus were here, we could accomplish a lot. You know? No evil people in the world, pink fairies. No evil people. Right? Uh, right? Uh, you know, it'd be all fine. No snow in Love in Texas. <laughs> Right? Like that, no snow ever happens here. Okay, so we can't do that. We gotta look empirically about how it is the consequences of these different alternative regimes, which means that we have to look at institutional solutions. It's an institutional problem, and it's fixed. The Leviathan is an institutional problem. That's what I'm trying to say. And it's fix has to be an institutional solution. That's what it means to do social science applied to political theory questions. Rather than establishing right and wrong, what I'm worried about is, can this institution actually bind this Leviathan? If Leviathan engage in juggling, and I wanna stop Leviathan from juggling, how am I going to bind Leviathan so it no longer juggles? Okay? So let's go through some of the basic facts here. <clears throat> um, another way to think about this, um, this is directed at my, I have a couple things that are really in here purposely for Ben and Ed, because um, we used to wrestle with this a lot, um, and I'm sure we'll have some good questions about it today too. But this is the way I want you to think about this. You have three functions of the government. A protective state, a productive state, and a predatory state. By predatory state, what I mean is some parties get together and take your money for their benefit. Okay? And they mean that means they predate on you. Now we have a problem of private predation. You've all experienced that. That's the you know, thieving, muggery, and things like that, right? Getting mugged, you wouldn't want to do that, right? But we also have public predation, which is government confiscating the benefits of your work or of uh, constricting you in the old days, right? You used to have to go and serve in the army no matter what, right? That would be predation. Right? These are kind of predatory ideas. All right? And so you have three, three kinds of governments. Protective state, productive state, predatory state. And the puzzle is, can I empower the protective state and the productive state without unleashing the predatory state? And if I unleash the predatory state, does it undermine my protective and my productive state? Okay, that's the puzzle. This is Madison's logic again. If men were angels, there'd be no need for government. If government were run for angels, there'd be no need for constraints. Precisely because men are gonna rule over other men, I have to first empower, then constrain it. 
That's Madison's, this is turning it into his. So, law and order, public goods, and then confiscation and cronyism. Okay, so, in my lack of creativity as a computer person, I have actually given you a completely scalable fly. Okay, which means that I start out with a little fly that I get from Google search, and then all I did in the PowerPoint is blow it up. But my professor, all right, used to ask the following question in class. He'd say, it is said that a fly that grew nine times its size can no longer fly. Architecturally, this turns out to be true. The fly, at its small size, its wings can support itself. But if you grew it nine times its size, their design of their wings is not an engineering miracle that's scalable. And in fact, under that new weight, those wings would not be able to function to get the fly to fly. Okay, so the question here embedded in this is government scalable. So if government is good at a small scale, can we just grow it to be at a big scale and it's okay? Or is there something that happens when we try to grow government? That means the government becomes more inefficient, unable to fly, unable to work. It's, I'm put there as a question, but I actually think, I've used this a fair number of times in front of these two characters, and they like to make fun of me about it, but you have to listen to the second line, which I'm just going to anticipate. I think economics, the students that are in here that are studying economics, the reason why economics is so vital to this conversation is because economics provides us with the fly swatter. It's economic theory that tells us when it is that fiscal dimensionality breaks down. And without economic theory, you just have the scalability question. Right? If you could do it once, you could do it a thousand times. Well, maybe not. Right? Maybe you can do it once or with 10 people, but when you try to blow it up to be at 100,000 people, maybe you can't do it anymore, let alone 10 million people. Okay? So this is the, the question that we're going to ask. But what we believe, the progressives believed, was that it was perfectly scalable. So let's just take a look at the, at the expansion of government in the 20th century. So uh, this is the Western Democratic States. All right? Um, and so what you can see in here is in the United States in 1870, uh, government spending as a percentage of GDP was only 7.3%. Uh, this year, you know, 2013, we're at 36.6%. Okay, uh, the average of the Western Democratic countries went from 10% roughly to 46.5%. Now, what's interesting is look at the, this is where Higgs will come back in. All right, look at where you would slice this data, by the way. So, you know, we go from 1870 to World War I, eve of World War I, to the end of World War I, to the middle of the Great Depression, uh, eve of World War II, to then, you know, uh, 1960, okay? In between that, by the way, the government, as a percentage of GDP spending, went way up and then came back down, okay? but not all the way down to pre-World you know, War II levels. But then look at what happened in the period of time in 1960 to 1980. And then from 1980 to 1990, by the way, take a good look at that. I happen to be a big Reagan lover because when I was a kid, believing in capitalism was a sign that you were stupid. So the fact that Ronald Reagan defended capitalism unashamedly was a very shiny example, but Ronald Reagan did not pull off the revolution everyone says that he did. What he did was he slowed the growth of government, but he did not reverse the growth of government during his time in power. But what he did do is he has great rhetoric. So I actually like his rhetoric a lot more than the reality under the Reagan years. Oppositely, I'm not that I need to talk about this, but oppositely Clinton, Clinton actually had expansion of economic freedom during his time because he couldn't do anything because he got checkmated. This thing that everyone doesn't like called gridlock, I'm like, yay, gridlock, because remember I want to tame Leviathan, so I'd like it to come to a slamming halt. 
you know, like traffic jam up the wazoo. But what Clinton did was he couldn't do anything, so the economy just took off like a bat out of hell because the government couldn't actually do anything during that time, which is great. Yay, Clinton, right? Uh, you know, like that. But his rhetoric was terrible. His rhetoric was the opposite of Reagan in, in, in a lot of ways. And so you have to sort out Reagan uh, re reality from rhetoric in a lot of these discussions. But um, so look, you know, from 2005 to 2010, this is during the height of the financial crisis. Look at the expansion that takes place, um, you know, in a short period of time. So this is kind of how it looks. Um, in terms of these, uh, the diagrams, what you can see is this growth now. When, what you'll do in Higgs is he slices this data a little bit more finely, so this will be really good to follow up in April, because what he does is he's gonna look at where these events occur, okay? So what's called in, in basically event analysis. So he's gonna look at when the event happened and what their relationship was with government spending before and then after the event. Right? And then he's going to slice the data again. So you get a real good, clear cut picture of what's going on here. But how about if we look not just so much at the scale of government, that's what we've been looking at, which is the way government grows, like the fly. So the fly has been growing. But now let's look at scope of government. That is what government is engaged in doing. And this is the classic example of how we counter this is from Milton Friedman. So, how many of you have watched Milton Friedman's Free to Choose? Do you remember when it first came out? It was great. When I was first being a college professor, I got in trouble because I used Milton Friedman's Free to Choose in my class and I laughed and the students complained to the professors that I was, you know, teaching one side of the issue. And I told the dean, the dean called me in and I said, well that, prof he, that professor wanted me to do equal opportunity. For every hour I showed Friedman, I was supposed to show an hour of Galbraith. And what I said was, then I could never teach, so why don't I have this suggestion? That professor should show an hour of Galbraith to offset my hour of Friedman. And I don't have to do it, he can do it. And then we have intellectual diversity. But why should I be responsible for doing it? Because even if he doesn't show Galbraith in his class, he's certainly talking about Galbraith since he's complaining about my class, right? Like that. That was a 27-year-old talking to a dean. I wonder if I, after all these years, if I would still be naive enough to take on the dean in my first week of teaching the same way. Um, my other story for my first teaching job, which is somewhat hilarious, is that I got this job. I was so excited about it. I showed up at work at 6 o'clock the first day of classes. And the department chairman called my home to tell me not to come in because the faculty had decided to go on strike. <coughs> and uh, and they, my wife you know, uh, answered and said, oh, Pete's already at the office. So the department chairman calls me and he says, you're at the office already. I said, Ron, I am so excited. I can't believe I'm here. I'm so excited, I gotta teach. And he goes, we're on strike. And I said, we're on strike for what? And he said, working conditions. And my response was, did someone get a nasty paper cut? <laughs> At which he did not have your reaction. <laughs> he just said, get out of that office and go home. And I said, really? I gotta go home? I can't work? I'm working on something. He goes, get out of that office right now. By midnight that night, the state and the union had solved their dilemma and they built in wage increases and so everyone went back to work the next day. So I was lucky. But this is Milton Friedman. And free to choose, Milton Friedman came up with the idea of pages in the Federal Registry. Pages in the Federal Registry for regulations. And he said, look, if we look back in U.S. history, just look at this. This is 1936, so, so right here, 1936. And look at that, it goes all the way to here, and then we have this hockey stick. Right? It's pretty amazing. So that's pages in the Federal Registry um, that shoots up. By the way, I want you to think about this because look at this period in here. Do you see a massive deregulation of the U.S. economy? You read in the New York Times, Paul Krugman thinks so. 
Like, all of a sudden, we went all the way back down to here. Well, if we did, I'm missing it. I would love to see it. Where is it? Well, because he makes it up. It's not true. Okay? So, if you look at the numbers here, right, again, look at these numbers here. You know, you do have in 2011 and 2012, the number of pages go down. But it's not like, you know, that's actually after, right, the financial crisis hits. <laughs> So we're not really talking about a massive, you know, amount of deregulation here as the cause, and even in particular certain types. But what you do have is you have government having more and more of its fingers in more of our economic activities. So we have this fly growing, and we have a fly that's like getting in, like bothering us a lot. So it's like you're going to dinner and the fly's all around your head all the time. So, and it's a big fly. It's not a small little gnat anymore. Okay, so what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is an inverted Christmas tree. Okay, so it was okay for government to continue to grow and expand in its tasks and whatnot, provided that trade and technology opportunities were expanding at the same time. If trade and technology are outpacing government expansion and regulations, then the economy is going to be better tomorrow than it is today. Okay? But one of those things is the ultimate resource is our demographics. So if you're having kids that are greater than two per family rate, okay, your base, tax paying base is growing. And the number of people who are drawing from the taxpaying base is smaller. Right? Again, just think about the logic of that. Well, what happens when the demographics flip? And the number of people who are actually working, right, reduces compared to the number of people who are expecting to get pennies from your work, transfers from that work. So you had a Christmas tree that looked like this, and then it looks like this. Now that's unsustainable. So what you get is this situation that Epstein talks about, which is that you have a massive expansion of transfer payments off an ever decreasing productive base of the economy, which means that the burden on the future generations is greater and greater and greater. So the marginal tax rates that your kids will face, you kids that are here as college graduates, the, mar the, the marginal tax rates that you will face and your kids will face is much higher than the marginal tax rates that I have faced during my productive life, okay, in order to be able to pay for the activities that I signed up for, all right? And here's the other thing. We're living longer. So I have less number of people, and people like me retire at 55 and live to 90. My, you know, grandparents or whatever, retire at 65, die at 67. Not so hard. You know, two years. Here you go, Grandpa. Two years. It's okay. But now me, I'm like sitting around hanging out for like 30 years. Come on, give it to me. And so what happens is the, the, the pyramid flips upside down. It's not a sustainable model of economic vitality. So we have a problem, and we have to fix it. So how are we going to fix it? Why do we have the problem? Here's the nature of politics. Concentrate benefits on the well-organized, well-informed interest groups in the short run. Disperse the costs on the unorganized and ill-informed groups in the long run. Okay, that's the nature of how democratic politics works. Concentrate benefits, disperse costs. All right, get ready. Who is the least informed and least organized interest group? Sperm cells. <laughs> they got no voice, they got nothing, right? So what's going on is you're always gonna push the cost out into the future generation because they got no voice or exit going on when the decision is made. Okay, so concentrate benefits today, costs tomorrow. So kids, 
You were just a gleam in someone's eye when a decision was made that I could retire at 55 and live comfortably until I'm 90. And you would pay for it. And you didn't even, weren't even around to like argue with it. And so this is the problem. So in the paper, not in my conversation, but this is for the economists that are in here. In the paper, we try to make an argument about why it is that the logic that says monetary and fiscal illusion get washed out in a rational choice model is wrong. Not because it's wrong in the long run, but that disturbances against the trend are a consequence of the fact that you have monetary and fiscal policy generating illusions in the short run. So you can play these kind of tricks on people. And they don't necessarily know when they agree to it that the net tax that they're going to have to pay is now included in their wealth today or something like that. Okay, so the Ricardian equivalence argument doesn't go through. Bauer was wrong. He's right on the long-term logic, but doesn't get the short-run logic. And Lucas is wrong about the neutrality of money. That's too insider baseball for the... But that's part of what the argument is in the paper. Okay, so what generates this? My juggler. It's that damn juggler. He's running those deficits, accumulating the debt, and then debasing the currency, and he keeps doing it. He's called Greece. And Greece isn't able to do it anymore. Why? Because we established the EU. And so then we said, oh, you can't debase. So he's like, <laughs> and he's like, this sucks. I might leave the EU. I'll leave. I'm going to take my balls and go elsewhere. What would happen if he went elsewhere? Devalue the your currency. Because that's the way we've always done things. Okay? So what do they rely on, by the way? Not that they change their fiscal behavior. So they didn't take this ball and then say, oh, okay, stop. They're like this, and then they're like, hey, by the way, bail me out. You're the you know, European Central Bank. Over here. Okay, now we go. That's what's going on in Greece today. This is exactly what Margaret Thatcher warned against. I didn't roll back the bureaucrats on Downing Street to have the bureaucrats in Brussels take away you know, our economic freedoms, right? And so this is one of the reasons why she opposed the European uh, Union, as well as the common currency and everything like that. Because she understood, by the way, the checks and balances that come from competition. <coughs> Angela Merkel's not too happy right now. Because Angela Merkel's doing what? She's like footing the bill of the bailouts, right? It's going on. So these juggling's going on. So what do you do with the juggler? It's easy, right? If someone's doing this in front of you, what could you do? You could take a rope and tie their hands. Not really. Well, feet, they're, they're, they're not going to be that good at jokes. Right. Now, here's the puzzle. Go all the way back again to the puzzle about, you know, who guards the guardian. So the theologians in the crowd, get ready. This is like, you know, one of those things like if God is omnipresent, or om omnipotent, he's so powerful, can he create a rock that he himself can't lift? Right, that's like a freshman late at night conversation. If you go to school like Grove City College, like All right, and so, right, so, you know, what's the puzzle there? Whatever. So here's the puzzle. A government that's strong enough to tie its own hands is strong enough to break those bonds anytime it wants. Right, I tie my hands and then I say, I don't want to have them anymore. So a classic example of that is Argentina. Argentina during the currency board crisis Right? What did Argentina do? They joined a currency board, which does what? Here's our juggling. It takes one of the balls, monetary policy, and eliminates it from the juggler. And it says, we're going to uh, you know, give that to the United States. So what we're going to do is simply peg our currency to the United States. But then what happens is the regional governors in Argentina, they showed no fiscal discipline. So what happened at the moment when, right before the crisis hit, you were confronted, just like in Greece, with a situation which is either stick to the currency board and therefore fess up to your irresponsible fiscal policy, or break the currency board and devalue the currency, which led to what? The Argentinian crisis. So when, this is why I mentioned you know, Judge Napolitano earlier, because if constitutions can't pinch, they don't do their job, right? A constitution is there to stop the government not to aid it. It's to put a constraint. It's to tie the hands. But if you can break them anytime you want, that's not much of a constitution. 
A constitution that's written on a word processor is not a binding constitution, okay? So, how have we done in this binding of the government's hands? So, three of my favorite economists, F.A. Hayek, Milton Friedman, and James Buchanan, arguably the leading free market economists in the second half of the 20th century. All three of them have started out by trying to find ways to bind the hands of the ruler. And all three ended up frustrated by their effort, that their efforts proved not to be effective enough against the bond binding. So what's left for us is the generation that comes after them is to go back and revisit that question again and to think to ourselves, well, can we figure out alternative ways to tie in the hands? Maybe what we need to do is take the bulls away. Government can raise revenue in only one of three ways. They can borrow, they can tax, they can inflate. If we take away their ability to borrow and their ability to inflate, well, excuse me, borrow when they are interest insensitive because they can inflate. That's where the problem comes in. Government can borrow, but they have to pay it back without paying it back with the debasement. Okay? And so then government would have to go into the market to actually, you know, bid those resources away, God forbid. And then maybe they would have to do a cost-benefit calculation on their public investments. And only those that met the economic calculation test would be those that they put forward, maybe, if we could somehow constrain them. So again, view my juggler, he's got the balls going, and now I'm gonna take away the balls with him. So the balls are gone, he's just doing this, no effect. But how else are we gonna have those effective tools of monetary policy and fiscal policy? Well, we look away at these things, eliminate the state monopoly and currency supply, okay? And we're seeing this, by the way, this is not as radical as you might think, okay? So we see a lot of things where state monopolies get started. One of them's called taxi cabs. What's emerging to get rid of taxi cabs? Uber, you guys all know about it. Do you think of it as like, oh my God, Uber, my God, the world's gonna crash and burn, it's going off its axis, <laughs> right? No, how about if we thought about the following thing, how about mail delivery, right? FedEx, how about email? How many of you, like, you know, my wife, she's clearing out our house. So she discovered some old letters that I sent her. We're high school sweethearts. So she discovered these old letters. She actually held me hostage on it because she did, I did something bad on Sunday, which basically means I told her I was working and I couldn't help her do stuff. So she said, I'm not gonna let you see those, those letters that you wrote. They were really cute, and now I'm not letting you see them. Um, so I was like, looking up, I gotta get this paper done. I can't wait to send her this link. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not allowed. She actually has ruled out that I'm not allowed to use her in my lectures, but anyway, but, uh, <laughs> it's not a credible commitment. It's tough. Um, but, uh, uh, so, you know, the, 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 different things come about. I can't imagine if I was dating my wife now that I would take time to write her a letter. See, this is a true story. I went away to college a year before she did. I wrote her a letter every day. Okay, I wrote her a letter every day that I was away, you know, missing her. I was very homesick and everything like that. And today I would just email her or text her even. And they would be like ridiculous. They wouldn't be long like feathery kind of letters, they'd be things like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know, and then she would write back, K, and I'd say, all right, see you <laughs> tomorrow, or whatever, and that would be it, right? And then, you know, we Skype or whatever. All right, um, so we don't get freaked out about that. So, but mail delivery was a, was a monopoly by the government because we claimed that we couldn't have mail. So technology totally erodes things. So when we do things like Bitcoin, for example, that might actually be a challenge to the existing currency monopoly. Uh, with different payment systems, PayPal, when it first got started, was really an alternative monetary system that was trying to be set up. It became an alternative payment system, a centralized payment system. My son's a musician. Basically means he has no income. And uh, so he doesn't have a credit card or anything, or at least I don't, I hope he doesn't, because that would be horrible for me to find out. Um, but he does have a PayPal account, and everything gets funneled through his PayPal account. 
you know, like people send him PayPal by, you know, transfers and then he pays out of PayPal and all that kind of stuff like that. So um, it's pretty amazing. So PayPal can do all of, of that. We don't worry about it. We don't have to have some central overseer to do that. So currency competitions can in fact exist and it's not that radical of a departure. Now how about when we think about competitive governments? Well, to a large extent, we're trying to go back to a pre-cartel federalism system in which you have true federalism, which has to meet certain strict conditions to ensure that the competition is always going on. And that we're gonna to try to use ambition to check ambition, the competition, the voting with your feet, the vo voice and whatnot. But we wanna enhance competition with fiscal affairs. And again, go to your, go to, just go to a club. Right? You go to a club, not an out on a club like you guys, but like a club, like a tennis club or a, a golf club or just anything like that. Think about all the services that are provided for you, but just by club fees. Or go to a private neighborhood. I, I'm, I'm sure there must be other private neighborhoods out here, do you know yet? But there's been a whole rise of private neighborhoods in America, especially in places where people feel like there's a lack of safety because they don't like the police or whatever, so then they have gate, what you've heard is gated community. <laughs> But in those gated communities, what's provided? An array of public services, right? That are provided for what? Union, user fees, right? Those are ways to provide. So is there ways that we can think about checking government by the competition of other providers of what might be called governmental services at local and local levels? And so we can sort of look at that. So we, have, we start out with some kind of notion of fiscal federalism and then push further. These are the kind of thinking that we have to engage in because our current system has no possibility of slowing down the growth in the size and scope of government. And that is unsustainable for our future. So that's my talk. I will open it up to any kind of questions here and I appreciate your patience uh, listening to me. Thank you.